All this that conference last... will now be recorded. You Sorry. may recall, <laughs> that's okay. In 2020, um, we had eight different signatory agencies across the federal family on an interagency MOU to support rapid response actions for invasive zebra and quagga mussels in Western waters of the United States. There's a link at the bottom. Um, and, you know, again, in light of all these rapid responses in Colorado and Dakotas and now Snake River, I just thought it would be good to remind you that there, this is uh, an MOU that's in place. And the purpose is to strengthen our coordination across the federal family to basically help it enhance capacity for our own federal agencies, states and tribes that are rapidly responding to infestations of mussels in Western waters. And the trigger for this MOU really is uh, to help participate in the implementation of coordinated interjurisdictional rapid response actions at an early stage when containment or elimination is likely. And secondly, when requested for help by that lead agency. So just as a reminder of some of the content within this MOU, it talks about the importance of coordinating with one another. Again, that means across our federal families and with the lead agencies. We want to help to support the development of rapid response plans and associated mutual aid agreements. And again, I like the conversation yesterday, Leah, that you led with respect to you know which states in the CRB have rapid response plans and or for mussels and you know plans for updating, et cetera. It's very much of interest. Um, another goal is data sharing. Another is to uh, monitor for early detection surveillance and make sure that we're doing so in coordination with our partners, as well as sharing timely information. And then this last one is calling on the federal agencies to share resources and increase our preparedness. Okay, so within this section E, there's a whole laundry list of things that we can do as federal agencies to help prepare for response. And I will say that actually this MOU was informed in 2022 20, sorry, in 2020, because, or it was informed by the after action reports from your tabletop exercises. So we looked at those uh, lessons learned, things that would help aid responses, and we tried to build that stuff into our MOU to help institutionalize it and operationalize it. So each year, the signature, uh, signatory agencies have gotten together once or twice a year, and we identify a priority to move forward with. So the things here in yellow um, are ones that we specifically had highlighted over the last few years. You might recall that for C and D, which is identifying resources that we can bring to the table, as well as our points of contact, we put that into one document and we've been updating that every year and we send it to Whiskey and CRB and WRP. So we typically do that around January to March, April, March to update it. So we'll be doing that again. And then another one there is encouraging tabletop exercises. And so again, this is something we heard about yesterday and our bureaus are either participating in those, leading them or funding them. And, and it is something that we're um, hoping to continue to elevate and, uh, and support going forward. But this last one is the one that I wanted to talk about really quickly. And I'm sorry, Leah, that's gonna go a little longer. So I'm sorry, actually, I should be apologizing to Heidi and Teresa because I don't wanna cut off your time. But so this one is coordinating the federal sector's role in supporting the creation and maintenance of equipment caches. And that came up maybe a little bit, maybe not in that terminology yesterday, but there was that conversation about those three different elements of things that might be helpful for preparedness. Years ago, I was talking with Alan Ployce about the, the importance of um, equipment caches, and he seemed to think that that would have been useful. And then I've been talking with Jeremy Crossland over the last few years as well about the core resources and whether we could use resources to buy equipment in advance of an actual incident. So anyway, this was something our um, agencies identified this year that we wanted to explore. Can we really start to make this happen? So we did an agency survey just within the signatory agencies about our authorities to purchase, um, fund, use, share, and store gear, equipment, and supplies. And we had a variety of different scenarios. And this probably, in the interest of time, I really won't be able to go over um, all of this. But the I guess the quick um, the quick answer is that. Our agencies generally have the authority to purchase gear, equipment, and supplies for use by their own agency. That makes sense. Um, they generally have the authority to fund others to purchase 
gear, equipment, and supplies for that entity's use. Um, then we had a series of questions about the ability to use gear, equipment, and supplies on um, agencies' projects at different locations. So if that agency owns that equipment and it was purchased for one project, can they use it for a different agency project in another location? And that answer was yes. Can one agency buy equipment and use it on another agency's quest uh, projects? That was uh, federal agency's projects. That was, we had a kind of a mixed bag of responses there. Um, some could, some couldn't. And likewise, you know, could a federal agency buy their own equipment and use it on non-federal projects? And again, some could, some couldn't. We also had a question about whether we could share equipment um, for use by others. So, um, so our agency, let's say, would buy gear, equipment, supplies, but the, yet another agency would use it on our lands for a response somewhere else. Um, so mostly said they did have the authority to do that. And again, um, when asking about sharing for sharing our equipment for use by others on other federal agency projects or on non-federal projects, there was uh, less clarity on whether they had authority or there was no authority to do so. And then we also asked about the authority to store gear, equipment, and supplies um, on our properties for use by our agencies. Of course, generally, yes, we could. Or could we store equipment, et cetera, et cetera, on our properties for use by others? And again, that was kind of a, a range of responses. So at the end of the day, um, we kind of asked for some additional input from the bureaus. And in terms of setting up the ability to share gear, equipment, all that stuff, um, if we wanted to do that, we could do that through cooperative agreements, MOU, interagency agreements, and contact, contracts. When asked, uh, asking the agencies if they had a current equipment cache, Reclamation was the only one that had started to design this rapid response trailer, which might be under that umbrella of an equipment cache. Other bureaus, they do have resources that they can share, but it's just not kind of grouped um, in, I know, such a way in a location that has multiple different resources, right? They're kind of scattered throughout the West. If there were limitations on doing equipment caching, um, it could have been because of uncertain authority, lack of funding, lack of capacity, space requirements or limitations, and liability. And not every agency had all of these, but these are just, you know, different examples. Um, other comments about equipment caching was whether uh, we wanted to consider a pilot, uh, you know, to, to find a location and try to pull key resources together, gear, equipment, supplies that would be needed in the event of a response. We talked about, I think, Heidi, this was your suggestion, you know, should we think about doing it in a remote location just in case, like, there was an access and it would be difficult, you know, to get supplies there. So maybe having a, a cache there would be useful. And then BIA is a member and responded to the survey, but they indicated that they may have limited authority, but tribes themselves might have more authority to do all, all of those things we talked about, purchase, store, share, use, et cetera. But despite some of these limitations across the federal agencies, there was an a, a interest in pursuing this. Um, but basically we said, you know, it's been a few years since we drafted the MOU. Um, when equipment caching was kind of something that we were talking about across the West, we wanted to revisit it with you and the WRP to see if it's still interested. So, you know, if, if there really isn't an interest from states and tribes for the feds to do some kind of joint equipment caching, then maybe we would focus on other aspects of the MOU that might be more relevant to you. So I know I, um, that's longer than I typically give uh, for an update, but I did want to take some time and just talk with you about, um, about that equipment caching. And again, I know, let me stop sharing here. Um, I know we don't really have time for, built in for discussion on this, but again, Teresa and Heidi and Jonas are there. I think Jonas is still there today. Um, they helped with this agency survey. And if you do have time throughout your meeting to talk a little bit about whether there's utility in equipment caching and whether you'd like to explore this with us, um, we'd love to know. Okay, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Leah. Sorry for being so rushed. That's okay. Is there a, I mean, is there a gut reaction on Hillary's question or if people want to mull that over? Is there utility still in the... 
cash idea. Tom Wolf. Uh, what kind of equipment are we talking about? Because I, I, I think I know, but I'd like to hear. I felt like that could be a next, next step, right? Like what would be in the cash? Right. Well, I, I'd really to look to all of you and, and what um, would be useful. I mean, I remember Alan, I think it was, or maybe from one of your, maybe it wasn't Alan, but one of your tabletop or field exercises where you needed a boom or something. And then there was um, a response. The tabletop basically said, well, the boom is all the way in Texas. So how do we, you know, the cost and the time to get that up to wherever the exercise was in the CRB. Um, so I, I would really look to you all and what kinds of things would be useful to have at the ready. But I suspect it would be like, um, you know, well, I don't know. Chemicals have a shelf life, but like, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it depends on what you guys. Sure. Hi, Hillary. Justin Bush, the new Allen boys, as it were. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I like the idea of this, and I, I do think that those things that Alan brought up in the past still have, have merit. Um, I'm part of a group talking about containment of technology, like sediment curtains and booms. And I think at this point, we don't necessarily understand <clears throat> what sort of equipment we would want to purchase and stockpile. So that might be a really good starting place. Is, to put um, significant effort into looking at available technologies, maybe figuring out what doesn't exist and where can get it, and then uh, and then developing a longer term plan to then purchase it in mass and stockpile it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, Damien, and then we have to go to Teresa. Go ahead, Damien. So, yeah, I think that's very valuable. I think Kasha through the core side, and then I work on the operation side. We already have we worked through this with. Environmental, on our environmental compliance for spill response. So we have storage caches that we share with Tidewater, other folks, Washington DOE, and they can come and get it. And then our NRM side, now our hydro side, that's where we store some of those, we have some separate yards, but our NRM side, our NRM projects, we can actually have, we have Tidewater setups, we have other agreements with local law enforcement for equipment, they can store boats, vessels, we have our own yards in the operation side that we basically said, here's a key that gets you in there. So if it was Tom coming from Montana to hit a Libby project, we can get you a key and store it and it's right near a water source. So there's, we've kind of done that in the spill response side. I would think you very easily mirror that on our NRM operation side, at least in the core of the projects we have in the Northwest that I know my colleagues, we have yards that we can basically allow storage. And it's our decision whether or not like we make you get a real estate license or we just basically like, sure, go ahead, store it, because it's a benefit to us, benefit to us. And it's even if it's your equipment, whether it's our equipment or it's joint bought, because we look at it that it's a, it, we can justify it in that the operation you're going to do within this river basin protects my project, protects my natural resources. So we can allow you to use our equipment or vice versa. And like I said, we've done it. We have not had to formalize it as much as you need to kind of see, but that's because we have a little bit extra discretion in the NRM side to decide whether or not we, we decide to license it, you know, create that type of stuff. We've just got written or even handshake type agreements. We have some interesting authority there. And I'm sorry, who was that who was speaking? I, didn't, I can't see. Damien. Damien, Damien Walter. Oh, great. The, uh, Perfect. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, Hillary, we could, this group could maybe give a little feedback of types of information. So I think maybe there's a to do item that we would okay. circle back with you on. So perfect. Thank you. So Thank you. I'm sorry for being long. I didn't <laughs> I know how important it is to run a tight ship. Yeah, we kind of are we keep the agenda packed. Okay, here's the okay. thing with Jim for all right, we do have a packed agenda. So thanks for letting me give a quick update for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And just I, I really appreciated yesterday Jesse gave kind of an overview of WDFW and all the different programs that happen in the state. And the Fish and Wildlife Service is no different. We have all different programs. Um, we have about 8,000 employees across the United States, so we're not the largest federal agency. But I just wanted to give you some highlights from our Fish and Aquatic uh, Conservation Program, which includes our aquatic invasive species. Uh, yeah, I mean, like our program priority. We have a lot of priorities, but for our aquatic invasive species, we're really trying to focus on prevention, early detection, rapid response. Uh, we have control management, and then we do a lot of coordination um, and communication. 
And I know in the past you may have heard me talk a little bit about our horizon scanning that we did for our region. If you want more information on this, I'd be glad to, but the idea of these horizon scans, whether they're at a national level or regional level, is to look at what, what are the things that we should be paying attention to that, we, that currently aren't on her, our horizon as far as aquatic invasive species. And that includes looking at climate matching from the donor regions and also the pathways of introduction. Um, we've done a lot trying to look at different species and the risk that they pose uh, for introduction. And this we have um, almost, I think now more than 2,000 species where this has been done. These are um, ecological risk screening summaries. And those are available all online and they're um, uh, ADA compliant too. So we're trying to get the message out on those aquatic um, species and the risk they pose for introduction. We've been doing a lot with hazard, or hazard analysis critical control point planning. So it's a planning tool to look at risk assessment for the different activities that we do. So that is part of our day-to-day -day natural resource work. We're not accidentally moving around species we don't need to. Um, we're doing a lot with monitoring and um, both with regular traditional sampling methods as well as kind of upping the game on molecular tools that we can use for monitoring in the field for both individual species and broad spectral monitoring. Um, we are very committed to doing rapid response um, and planning for rapid response and we do our own control and management work at the sites, our facilities we manage that include our national fish hatcheries. We have um, significant lands associated with those hatcheries as well as our, our water resources. We're really making, we really want to make sure that our water resources are secure for us to be able to continue our operations as well as for our national wildlife refuges. We do a lot of invasive species work on our refuge lands. Um, we're trying to do some uh, work on um, things like using YY mail. We have a project, a pilot project, looking at brook trout. And so these are some of the things that we're um, trying to, to focus on, as well as an incredible amount of coordination and communication, hopefully with you all, um, as well as uh, other, other partners and the public, and internally within our own staff. Okay, so just some highlights for our 2023 monitoring. Uh, we do do uh, visual inspection surveys at all of our fish hatcheries. I'm, I'm focusing more on our hatcheries and on our refuges. Um, and we have completed eDNA monitoring at our hatch hatcheries for zebra and quagga mussels, northern pike. Um, common carbon New Zealand mud snail. We really are concerned about New Zealand mud snail and we don't want to move them around with all of our fish operations that we do. Um, we did have a new detection of New Zealand mud snail, but that, that was at Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so we're, we, we do have signage up with that and that was reported to WDFW and also USGS for that new sighting. And we also uh, discovered Chinese mystery snail at Basket Slough National Wildlife Refuge. So that's another species that we're looking at um, to, uh, that, that's of concern. But again, at our fish hatcheries, we did not have any detections for um, And then you, you've heard a little bit about um, additional uh, surveillance using eDNA and kind of trying to develop some validated um, eDNA primers for that work um, for different priority species. And this isn't, a final list, this is just uh, some of the species that we are concerned about in our region. If you have any input on this of critical aquatic invasive species that you would love to have some type of a molecular tool for, please, please let me know. I would love your, your feedback and input. <clears throat> uh, from our perspective, we're looking at uh, for, for our hatcheries, what aquatic invasive species would be game changers for our operations, for both our facilities, our infrastructure, as well as you know our, our, our moving, our, our fish production. Um, but then, then downstream or in receiving waters, especially for our salmon work, what, what invasive species are impactful to their success? So those are some of the priorities that we're looking at. Uh, but again, any and all input would be great. And again, I just wanted to highlight where we started this project with YY brook trout, um, trying to push toward eradication of brook trout in icicle, 
I said, you know, um, sorry, Kai East Range near Carson National Fish Hatchery. And uh, this was started in 2018, or fiscal year 18. And so this is moving forward. We're doing an incredible amount of genetic testing to show proof of concept for this. And if you want a more in depth presentation on this someday, I would love to share that information with you. But we're we're looking at this and hoping that this might be not an immediate tool, but it is a, a tool that we're looking at that could push toward eradication. Uh, we do our best with European green crab trapping and monitoring and coordinating, again, especially with um, Washington Sea Grant and our partners with um, WBOW and others, especially our tribes on green crab management. But again, this is in our, our fish hatchery or all wildlife references, trying to support our lands management for green crab. Oh, and, and I need to say we do have our national management plan for green crab. We work very hard on this, not we, me, like the fish and wildlife service. We do like a large working group of partners. And um, we submitted that for solicitor's review. And at some point, I, I feel like it's a broken record. At some point, it will go into the public register for 40, 45 day comment period. <clears throat> I'm told that we're closed. So I, again, I, I, I do my best, the squeaky wheel, but so far the squeaky wheel, it, it's coming. That's what I've been told. Um, we have no idea what FY24 funding is gonna look like, but I did wanna highlight that we are very committed to making sure that our state plan funding for um, you all for the state plan implementation is existent and you know, provided to you all. Um, also, Barack Shemai, Probably know him out of our region two office. He manages our Quagga Zebra Muscle Action Plan grants. He's hoping to have that new list of funding opportunity out in the new year in January. Early on, uh, we have permission to put that notice of funding out prior to having our appropriations. So that's um, a good step in getting the process going. Uh, we do have a multi agency agreement with the Bureau of Reclamation, National Park Service, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, manage some of our um, more recurring costs for um, things like the watercraft inspection database and um, watercraft inspection training. So that is, um, we still have that interagency agreement and that's, uh, we feel like that's a strong um, thing just to keep things moving and be more little uh, streamlined. And again, this is just my, my what keeps me motivated is that I'm, I'm really trying to stay on the prevention end because I feel like that's where uh, we have the best opportunity to uh, keep doing this work. And that's why we, we really are trying to do better with the surveillance um, and, and getting, getting the tools out there for prevention, but also our, our HACCP training. This is my little plug that if you do have dates, I've already talked to Heidi, if you have critical dates or meetings where you would like to have um, the HACCP training, it's a two-day workshop. Um, please get in touch with me. You know, I, uh, we have multiple trainers um, across the United States, and we'd love to try to help um, get the message out on HACCP. There's our contact information, so please get in touch. Thank you so much. Any question for Teresa? Oh, go ahead. Do you think the brook trout pilot study is looking good? Is trending good? Or are we it's promising. Way? It's promising. It's tough, though, because we're lucky at Tidy Springs, it's more of a closed location. And so we feel really good about all the electrofishing that we're doing to remove the brook trout and then adding in um, the, the YY males. Um, it may not be the best tool for for different systems, but we're trying to figure out what, what that's going to look like. Like if it's a more open system, um, it, it, you, it just may be harder to, to re remove enough fish to see promise. But again, we're, we're looking at it as a long-term solution. So for the brook trout, like our modeling was looking at maybe six, seven, eight years of, of time of doing this intense work where we, we want to be able to show efficacy. Um, but it's it's promising. Um, but it's it's also not like a set it and forget it kind of tool. Um, we're doing 
doing genetic analysis. We have a lot of population modeling ahead of that work. Um, again, we're trying to do scientific management. So, but I can follow up with you on that. And we can have you talk in a future CRB meeting. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Okay, so next up we have Heidi McMaster to talk about VOR, regional funding opportunities. All right, I feel like a lot of the stuff that I talk about is actually just repeat uh, coattailing on other agencies' work because we're so small, but, you know, I'll, get, I'll do my best. Uh, so I'll give you some overall highlights of what we're up to, uh, what we did for FY23. Um, I have on here for 24 project words, but that hasn't come out yet. Sorry. I know everybody's like, and, and I, part of it is uh, we have no budget. Uh, I don't know. Uh, speed of government. Sorry. Uh, and that should be 23 monitoring season. Uh, so we funded in 2023 19 projects reclamation wide with, out of about $2.6 million that we were allocated from the president's budget. Uh, six of those projects came to this region. Uh, we received uh, about $683,000 of that total. Uh, this Ocan tribe, while well, we got early detection and monitoring uh, for Lake Roosevelt. We funded our Freighter Field Office in Washington for some additional monitoring work uh, in the reservoirs there. We got uh, Confederated Tribes with Caldwell Reservation. We have been funding them now, I think, for maybe this might be the fifth year uh, for their regional coordination and monitoring. Montana Fish Wild and Wildlife Code Parks for their hot water decontamination and signage. And Tom's like, yay! <laughs> Uh, Grand Teton National Park, uh, we funded them for some additional uh, uh, personnel for their uh, inspection stations. Uh, we're still trying to ramp that up in comparison to Yellowstone, so hopefully nobody on the park service is online going, hey, uh, we're trying to get the, the Teton side uh, built up a little bit more. Uh, and then the Shoshone Paiute Tribe, uh, Duck Valley, which we had a rapid response exercise with them uh, earlier this year. Uh, to fund for a hot wash station. So we have uh, this really large chart where I just track all this money that we've spent over the years, uh, 23 funding. You can see we we received uh, quite a bit of chunk in FY18, kind of the start and the peak of uh, this funding. Uh, because of the Tiber, Canyon Ferry, everything kind of like, oh, we have to protect the Columbia Pacific Northwest, and then we have issues that pop up in South Dakota or in Colorado, and so money every year kind of gets shuffled around for basic uh, priorities. So we're still doing pretty good for a region receiving uh, some money, and uh, as something that I'm trying to do and improve for this process is I, I'm going to give a um, Kind of an opportunity to review the with those that didn't get funding or they did get funding but uh, there could be improvement on the process we're going to do some of that feedback um, because uh, i've been at, I active in the regional or not regional the reclamation wide uh, position and got to go through the process so i know what happened where i didn't know how it worked before so i'm going to uh, hopefully work with everybody that we get funding to, to kind of improve the projects that were being submitted. So stay tuned. Uh, we sampled 40 reservoirs. I went through some of this yesterday. Uh, we sampled by uh, cross-polarized light microscopy at our lab in Boise. Uh, eDNA is done by our lab in uh, Denver. As, since I talked about monitoring yesterday, I'm going to talk about our priorities. So we have early detection notification protocols. Uh, this was really triggered on the front of Tiger Canyon Ferry. Uh, Reclamation uh, de uh, developed our own notification protocols in the event of a muscle detection. Uh, right now we have, uh, they're all under revision because they're a couple years old. And following the Snake River event, we realized we, our notification protocols are a little out of date. Context change. We have to stay more on top of it. So it's a lessons learned that we actually have to pay more attention to uh, these protocols to make sure that uh, they're reflecting the most current information. Uh, boot brush stations. 
uh, through a grant with the Knight NASMA, uh, we received some loop brush stations <coughs> in different spots to prevent uh, some uh, movement. Uh, we are, like Teresa mentioned, we're now gearing up for HACCP training. Uh, we have at the Re for Reclamation uh, an annual muscle and IPM coordinators meeting for all of our regions in Denver. And this year we uh, decided we were going to bring Fish and Wildlife Service to do this training for all of our coordinators so then they can start branching down uh, for IPM plans, etc. We're looking at biocontrol. Uh, this is relatively new for us. It's mostly done by other people, but we're trying to get more involved in that. And then eDNA, we are oh, we have a scientist. I don't know if everybody knows Yale Passamanic in our lab. He's working on gen, uh, the genetic and biomarkers for crayfish uh, for eDNA. This came about because we had uh, some canal damage in our irrigation districts. So he's been working on uh, some of that information. And that sums it up, and I swear there was something else I was going to mention because that didn't make it in slides, but of course I get up here and I'm like, if I remember it, I'll tell somebody. Thank you, Heidi. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, when I what, oh. brush stations uh, they go at trailheads or park areas for reclamation. They're at uh, marinas and things like that for people to clean off mud, weeds, and things uh, off their boots. They're not just going for aquatics, they can go at just regular trails, but uh, the NASMA received some funding and potentially some more funding coming through to uh, fund some more of those coming up in the next fiscal year. Are there any specific species you're trying to clean? No, it's just generic uh, cleaning your boots because boots carry seed and everything else. It's just kind of an overall target. Okay. Are they being installed like throughout the region or specifically here in Washington or where are they? Throughout the Throughout reclamation, so we did receive some, uh, but they're all across the 17 western states. Okay. Uh, so they're this year was the first year that we got them, uh, and so they're they're we're getting more and more of those put up. Okay. okay thank you. Okay, so we're going to segue to our province and state updates, and starting with British Columbia. So Martina back. And Miles Groves, yep. Uh, let's see. Where am I? Okay, so we're going to give just an update on our um, watercraft inspection station portion of the invasive muscle program in British Columbia. And so we've been running our watercraft inspections in the program since 2015. And I just wanted to start off by acknowledging uh, the big aspect of our program and, and how it's been so successful is all the partnerships and collaborations. In particular, we've had a range of um, different program funding partners over the years. So this uh, just shows a snapshot of our current and, and past uh, program uh, funding partners. So uh, we have contributions coming from our hydropower uh, partners, as well as um, federal and then across a number of our ministries in terms of point, uh, provincial coordination as well within um, the government of BC. And then beyond just our funding partners, of course, um, there's all the partnerships that extend beyond that as well. In terms of a kind of uh, season summary, I'm going to pass it over to you to talk about our kind of station operations. Sure. So um, uh, this last season, we hired 43 seasonal uh, inspector staff. Uh, and that's in addition to the, the three or four full-time positions that we have to administer the program in the Conservation Officer Service. So the way it works in British Columbia, uh, Martina deals with the science and the stats, and, and uh, uh, we work very closely together. And then uh, Conservation Officer Service is a service provider back to uh, run all the inspection stations and do the inspection and enforcement. So, um, six stations. Uh, and two roving crews, so you can see from Dawson Creek all the way down to uh, Olson along the Alberta border. And then we've got uh, Yak and Asuyas along the uh, U.S. border. And then uh, in the lower mainland and in Penticton, um, majority of that work is uh, roving crews. However, we do 
temporarily set up at uh, Pacific and Sumas down uh, along the, the U.S. border there. This year we had, um, uh, especially with the Idaho positive, we, we've been dealing with uh, CBSA uh, fairly closely. That's the Canadian border. Um, uh, border services agency. Services agency. They, um, uh, so they're notifying us that the high risk goal is coming through the border from the U.S. and that we generally have a roving group person or somebody down in um, along uh, Yak and Kumi's there uh, with Idaho orders to, uh, to follow up. So uh, the CBSA will actually seal the boat and, um, and get a hold of us right away so we can follow up with whatever's, uh, whatever's needed that way. Um, as far as uh, the, the enforcement side, we typically do about 100 blow by enforcement actions a year. Uh, it's a combination of warnings and, and charges. The, um, uh, in, in addition to all the decontamination orders and follow ups uh, after that, uh, Martina has the, the numbers for all the our decon orders. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's proving good. Uh, budgets are always kind of a black cloud over our head uh, from year to year to, to try and figure out how many. Weeks. Uh, how we can offer operationalize our our, uh, our program, but uh, um, uh, I think we're pretty successful this year um, with with our detections and um, with what we uh, able to, to clear off. The majority of the Canadian boats coming from the east coast or from the from Ontario and and out east uh, do come through Golden uh, to the Trans Canada Highway, and uh, we, we do see quite a Quite a bit of a busiest station there, so that's possible. That uh, this is number of um, inspections total by station, so um, and that's also the main corridor for commercially hauled transporting boats coming through Ontario. So, so that one we try and run 24 7 uh, with night shifts uh, there. The rest of them are mainly just during the day on uh, our stations. Okay, um, I can just give a quick snapshot of um, the inspection data. So this just shows um, some of our kind of high-level summary stats um, comparing 2022 to 2023. So um, actually quite similar. Uh, we, we did have relatively similar level of operations. So it's all about the same, just shy of 21,000 inspections this year. Of that, we had um, 155 that were high risk um, for EIS and, and required further follow-up. So um, we've sort of refined how that's kind of being reported over the years. So if the boat's coming through and it's from a high-risk jurisdiction, but it's found to be clean, dirty, dry, that's not going to get reported as high-risk. So we've kind of tried to adjust that a little bit. Um, intercepted 14 muscle fowl boats um, in total. In addition to those 14, there were another five boats that came through that we have been notified about from um, someone else's program, whether it's Alberta, um, or folks here in the room, and when they came to us, we did the follow-up inspection, they were found to be clean during drive, so, which is great, and, and you know, of course, uh, what we want to be seeing, so uh, that's on top of the, the 14 that did come through uh, with muscles. We had 70 uh, decontaminations performed. Um, another piece that we do track is um, kind of interactions with the public. So this is kind of um, looking at uh, how many people were sort of educating on the clean during drive as well as looking at the compliance at our inspection stations. So this is the percent of um, boats that are stopping at the inspection station. And so uh, consistent, pretty consistent over the last several years at about 88% of compliance. So we've seen a slow kind of steady increase in kind of plateauing right now. So uh, generally trending in the right direction. <coughs> we've seen any kind of decrease in that. Um, again, this year is just showing uh, inspections by station. As Miles mentioned, uh, Golden is certainly our most, um, our busiest station. Uh, it's not included here, but and the other piece that of course we look at is um, the percent of high risk inspections relative to total. So some of our stations that don't necessarily see as high numbers, uh, except the Dawson Creek and our Soyuz border, see quite a high percent of um, high risk boats. So um, that's also what we can factor in. We've had stations in the past that had highest volume of boats, we had less than 1% high risk and they were really just seeing local boats coming through. So that's part of how we're kind of assessing, prioritizing our stations. Um, as mentioned, um, Miles mentioned kind of the Ontario. So this is uh, looking at the breakdown of those 14 muscle foul boats. We continue to see 
um, typically about 60 to 70 percent every year coming from Ontario and the Great Lakes. So we certainly saw that trend um, continue this year. In terms of where those votes are destined for um, in BC, this is just rolled up by kind of region. We do collect information about the individual water body where they're destined for. And we continue to see um, certainly the majority destined destined for the lower mainland and the Okanagan. So that's where we have those roving crews that have the ability to respond and deal with those um, decontaminations and follow up. I um, wanted to mention a highlight was um, the ability to go down and visit um, Twin Falls and be an observer on that response. So really appreciate um, the invite from uh, from. Nick and Lloyd to come down and uh, get the opportunity to, to experience and um, get kind of the hands dirty and, and learning from that response. Um, following uh, the detention, I hope there's certainly been, I would say, a heightened awareness um, by British Columbians on um, sort of the threat and, and prevention on invasive mussels. So um, over the past kind of oh, throughout the fall, there's been uh, a number of sort of calls to action in terms of um, invasive mussel prevention so that public awareness, um, I'd say in the Okanagan and in BC has already been quite strong and this sort of, I would say, kind of um, brought that forward further. So there's been um, calls to action relating to um, actually having a full moratorium on boats um, coming into BC. So there's been some uh, kind of different uh, sort of uh, pieces coming forward as a, as a result of that. Um, and then uh, just wanted to touch on um, some new Dresden and muscle detections here in Canada, just really quickly. Um, back in September, there was a new detection, uh, first detection of zebra mussels in uh, New Brunswick. So um, in 2022, there was a detection along the uh, Port St. John River, uh, just bordering with New Brunswick and Quebec, where they're already present. And then unfortunately, uh, downstream did move into New Brunswick. And the most recent uh, just came out uh, in November is confirmation of zebra mussels. <coughs> Mountain National Park. So there were some past uh, detections through eDNA, but there was actual confirmation of mussels um, in uh, that national park in Manitoba. So um, and we do work really closely with our Western Canadian counterparts in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and the Yukon on um, coordination and we meet monthly, um, if not twice a month, to really make sure we're staying coordinated and also trying to really help uh, Manitoba as they're kind of on the front lines of um, dealing with uh, the increasing spread in, in Manitoba. And just really quickly, uh, some of this has already been talked about yesterday, so I'll, I'll be really brief to try to save time. But um, as mentioned, we're going to be planning, uh, starting the early stages of planning for a uh, joint rapid response exercise. Um, and that is looking at uh, doing it in the shared water body of Lake Kupanusa. We're in the process of updating our rapid response plan. Um, just, it was originally uh, developed before we even had our invasive muscle program and our inspection stations, and, and now we're, we think it's a good time to be updating and revising that. A lot's going to be uh, hopefully kind of building from what we learned during that rapid response exercise. And then, um, as with everyone else, we're in the planning stages for the coming season. So we'll leave it there. A question for Martina or Miles? Yeah, Martina, do the, any of the Eastern provinces uh, do boat inspection programs? So um, Manitoba West all have um, inspection programs. Um, Ontario uh, doesn't, they do have some work around Clinton <laughs> and Quebec, I believe, does have some decontamination units, but um, certainly Manitoba West to BC all have inspection programs and we work really closely. Um, same as with this group, we receive notifications from them anytime they have uh, been accepting folks destined for BC. So across the kind of Manitoba West, we work really closely. So. Good, great, thank you. Oh, no, it's not zebra quad muscle, but about the marble crayfish, the first field detections in Ontario. I don't know. If yes, if yeah. You are um, like helping or looking at marble crayfish and there's plenty of other workers going on. Yeah, and we do, um, there's a national aquatic invasive species um, committee, so we, and that's all the provinces and territories participate in that, and we do um, work with our Ontario colleagues, and I think there was actually just a webinar earlier this week. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and someone from my program attended it, I think we've been in, in touch with them, and so um, we, 
we are um, doing active modern currently for crayfish, but it is something that we like we brought our reporting out. We'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon. So um, it's certainly and across kind of Western Canada and even nationally, the marble crayfish is certainly, I would say, one of the priority species that's been identified for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, thanks for seeing that. Thanks, Brian. All right, next we have Rick Boatner to talk about Oregon's program. Rick's last meeting for the Columbia River Basin. <laughs> well, Megan's correct, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> One thing I'll warn you, the older you get, the more emotional you get. Which oh. I find very uh, disturbing. <laughs> okay. Uh -oh. Okay, for our program, we're in partnership with Oregon State Marine Board. Uh, Oregon State Marine Board collects the funding for our AIS uh, sticker, not stickers, but permit. Permit, thank you. You lose your memory too, as you <laughs> Uh, and they also deal with our the law enforcement contracts that work at our check stations. You know, sometimes, hopefully, 48 hours a week, but it's not very often. So we're trying to work on that, see if we get a little more uh, law enforcement presence, because the amazing compliance goes way up when we have a, a policeman right there. So kind of amazing. Uh, so I'm going to go over the summary real quick. Okay, our program we're in our 14th season, we finally broke 200,000 inspections. Uh, and for those who know, in 2010, we started the program. It was on a voluntary basis only. We had a very small staff, and most of our uh, inspections, we did a lot of boat ramps, uh, a few roadsides, but mainly it was for outreach and education. And back in those days, a roadside, we might have had a 20%. Clients. And they were all generally boats that were clean, uh, dirty boats that come in. Uh, in 2011, we did get authority to do mandatory stops, but our governor didn't sign the bill until almost in the end of August, so it really didn't help the 2011 season. So in 2012, we moved all our stations to the border that we had because we had mandatory stopping authority. And in 2017, we started receiving word of funds which helped, but we were really able to use it in 2018, so we basically doubled our staff, uh, extended hours at our check station, and, <clears throat> and in 2018 and 2019, pretty good years. We were actually full, fully staffed when season started. It was one of those dream, dream years. Uh, so we done, you know, as a program, 167 interceptions, uh, but most of our interceptions are more for uh, other aquatic biological bio Eurasian metal foil, paired feather, and these things uh, compared to aquatic zebra mussels. Okay, so our 23, 20, 2023 program was supposed to look like this uh, if we got fully staffed. So in Oregon, we have two stations that we keep open the entire year. We keep the Ontario station open uh, the winter. We have to staff just by two people and short hours, so we keep seven days a week, daylight hours. Uh, and then Central Point is also our Ashland station on I-84. Uh, that stays open with two people uh, during the winter. In the summer, we add two seasonals to each of those to give us more coverage. Now, Central Point is our busiest check station. <clears throat> uh, we'll get anywhere from, depending on the year, um, 6,500 6, to 9,000 9, inspections every year. Ontario is next. They get about oh, 4,000 inspections. But they will intercept most of our mussel boards coming from the Great Lakes, like Powell and such. So everything's cool there. We were able to add, we were supposed to start May 1. Staffing problems made that impossible. So we, we opened Klamath Falls. Then we, in June, we were able to put a roving team. And this was the first time we had this. The roving team was going to go to state parks around the state, may, mainly do public. Uh, education and outreach, that was their main goal, not really inspections. Um, but unfortunately, we were not able to hire staff for Ontario, so they spent their whole summer working, backing up the Ontario station so we covered the volume. And then we finally got staff at Brookings and then at Umatilla, but that was late June. Uh, we were supposed to do uh, a station in Lakeview, 
but for 2030, we were down six staff members. So far, small program efforts for good. Uh, but, you know, exciting, you know, in the season, we had lots of applicants. I was so excited. I was going, this is going to be a great year. <laughs> we're going to make it easy. That didn't happen. Uh, a lot of us, we just had low response to interviews. We had a lot of people, no shows, which was really weird compared to years past. Uh, we were competing with a lot of other, you know, all of us hire seasonals at the same time. Every program is going, so we're trying to steal from each other. Uh, and a lot of us in the last few years of employee housing has been very difficult, especially you get on the coast, you can't find a place uh, hardly uh, where our people are. So as an agency, we're starting to put a committee together and developing things like when we do remodels of our wildlife areas or our hatcheries, uh, they're going to include uh, trailer pads with full hookups that we can purchase trailers so we can house our employees or they building bunkhouses as a program. We're purchasing at least one or two rooms in the bunkhouses so we can have uh, housing for our employees. And then come up with a lot of other things like leasing apartment buildings so everybody can share. So we've gone through everything. We'll see how that works out in the coming uh, few years. Okay, with Idaho, our next steps. Uh, monitoring. We have lots, as you saw yesterday, there's lots of people that monitor the snake in the Columbia River, which is great. Uh, and I don't know if Kat's talked to you about this yet, Kat, but one of our questions that we always ask, you know, last water body and next water body. So from that information, the boats that came from the Twin Falls area, we tracked where they were they were going. So there's a few more water bodies that we want to get sampled more often, like Jubilee Lake. I don't think anybody does, but that's where a lot of our stand-up kayakers and stand-up paddle boards, Detroit Lake, we have a few that they were going to. So we need to look at those a little closer. You do have that, that's good. I didn't know. I know I talked to Kat, but I need to talk to you. We've got our field <laughs> uh, So we're going to increase that. Uh, we're going to have our, if we can hire our normal uh, stations open, uh, Central Point and Ontario will be open the entire year. Uh, the other stations, seasonal stations, will open up May 1 and run until about mid September. And then we're going to try to add five stations. We found that the Ontario station, uh, especially the Boise folks, the local folks, have figured out how to bypass the station. And they take the first exit before the inspection and come across at Fruitland. Uh, and then we have five other bridges that they're coming across that will hope to add stations. Um, in a perfect world, we're going to hire 15 bodies to do that. that but we already figured if we only can hire one team, we'll just put them on a random sampling and maybe throw everybody off for a little bit. Uh, so we'll see on that. So we'll do more, more of that. And then uh, any watercraft that's coming out of the Twin Falls area, we'll at least do a flush if we don't find anything on the engine. So that's kind of that one. So quick questions. <laughs> Thank you guys, it's been great. Uh, it's a great group. Now, if you guys got some fun projects, there's my contact after Fe starting February 1. Don't worry. Yeah, that yeah. works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Any, oh, Tom. Tom, so do you have additional funding to stand up additional stations? How's that work? No, yes and no. <laughs> no. We have some savings fundings, but we may have to go for, ask for more funding from Morda or pull some from tax checkoff, uh, which I've used for a lot of things. So we're going to be putting funding together, but I feel it's more important to get those going. At least we have funding for sure for one year. But we'll have to see down the road. We'll see. And then I'm hitting every talk I'm doing, which Idaho's discovery has made a lot of talks come up. Everybody's curious about Idaho and what you've done. I thank you for all the information, Nick. It's been helpful. So I'm pushing that. We need more funding all the time, and especially an emergency fund that we can access really quick. So anybody that will listen to me, I'll talk to you. Give them that spill.
Thank you, Rick. Yep. Okay. All right. Next, we are going to hear about uh, Idaho's program. I don't know if this is a recap or looking forward. It's your choice. <laughs> Well, well, combo, right? It's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're we're obviously in flux right now. Um, a lot of this is preliminary. A lot of the the data crunching and the, the cool maps and the charts that I usually have are just simply not ready yet. Um, we've extended the season for the majority of our boat check stations through the end of November. Well, first started in October, then we kept it going through the end of November. And then we've actually still have one station that's going to be operating until the end of December and most likely going to be moving towards a year round inspection um, station. So, uh, again, we're, we're not really at the point where we've got those end of year numbers and, and maps crunched yet. A lot of our focus has obviously been on the mid snake and the delimit surveys and the, the treatment polygons and that side of the data. Um, we also share our GIS analyst with other programs in the agency so i'm just really cognizant of his workload and and making a request like this is significant so um but to give you an idea i usually start out with this slide that the watercraft inspection prevention program is just one of many little projects that we're working on um, it is one of our more visible programs to the state uh, public interfacing obviously a, a customer service there with the voter uh, but there are many other uh, programs that we're working on as well. Give you a snapshot on budget, similar figures that I've had in May, June, last time we met. Um, ongoing support from the general fund, the Idaho General Taxpayer Fund, um, one time spending authority for the APC funds, what we used to call the WERDA funds, watercraft inspection and monitoring. Um, we have base spending authority for invasive species sticker fund. That's a dedicated fund, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday, that by taking watercraft inspection, Army Corps of Engineers, Warda Fund, the APC funds, um, it's allowed us to run a balance and have a rainy day fund in our, our dedicated sticker fee. Um, so that's been helpful for things like a rapid response that costs millions of dollars. Uh, we also have an, an ongoing, or this is a one-time anticipate the interest is going to continue to harden our inspection stations and to have more infrastructure and, and services there like water and sewer and power. Um, so this this happened last year that it was a $600,000 enhancement for inspection stations for the actual structure of the building. Um, we've been working with the Department of Public Works on these projects. Many of them are located on ITD facilities where you have state owned lands. But it's really complicated, um, the permitting side of it, and trying to get vendors and bids. Uh, the, the environment out there for a contractor is, is, pretty, is pretty good on the contractor side. And you, you can send stuff out the bid, and you're like, okay, I want this big shiny thing. This is my pot of money. And you may come back with zero bids, probably because it's out in the middle of nowhere, and there's, there's no hotels, or they would have to put their, their workers up in a trailer. Um, when there's a more beneficial project in town, you know, in Twin or in Boise or in Idaho Falls. And so you may put something out to bid and uh, you don't get any bids. And then obviously we have other federal grants that we're pulling from, whether it's aquatic plants or terrestrial noxious weeds, or obviously the boat inspection stations and the monitoring. Our outreach program is only almost fully funded by Fish and Wildlife Service and as planned grants. So uh, there's other funds at play here, and it gets interesting when you're trying to have a grant that has 50-50 cost share match, or if you have a grant that has um, really minimal or no match, and, and making sure that you're doing state to state or state to federal, uh, that's where all the grant writers and the grant books get really important. Um, 2023 watercraft inspections, obviously the, the environment's fully changed now. It was our 15th year of the program, inspecting just over 100,000 boats, uh, around 30 muscle-found boats, and this this number still needs to be updated because it, the chart on the website stopped in September when we got really busy, and I know we had two or three muscle-found boats that came through during the response that we responded to, but we just need to catch up and archive those, document them, get them on the web page, 
So this is more uh, likely like 32 to 33. Uh, that may still go up because we've still got stations that are open. 15 of them were deaths in the Idaho, so half of them were going into the basin somewhere. Um, 19 inspection stations, again, majority of them are located at the borders. We'll talk about Twin Falls last. Um, eight local station cooperators, and I'll have a, a list of them specifically. We're extending nighttime operations. I anticipate this conversation is going to evolve. Um, this winter, as we're making preparations for next year, expanding stations, um, the season, nighttime, more stations. It'll be interesting to see where the Idaho program evolves from here. And I anticipate nighttime is going to be a part of that conversation, as well as law enforcement support. And to give you an idea, um, I, I have a slide on law enforcement support. But first, we'll talk about station cooperators. These are the folks that really get the majority of the work done on the ground for watercraft inspections. So we're supporting two inspection stations in the state of Utah. Uh, we're working on an agreement for this year and next year so that that support is going to continue. Um, we're working with cooperators up in northern Idaho like Bonner and Kootenai Shoshone Swatter Conservation Districts. That's seven of the 19 stations with those two cooperators alone. They're huge partners. Once in Sandpoint, once in Coeur d'Alene taking care of the majority of the panhandle. Great people to work with. Uh, we're also working with Bruno Solar Conservation District, two of our stations, a couple of counties like Franklin County, um, Oneida Solar Conservation District, they oversee the Malad Station. That's I-15 North, one of our primary corridors for boats coming out of Lake Powell. And if you look on the chart, it'll tell you which stations come out of boats. You can bet that Malad is a front runner because of Lake Powell. Uh, the Shoshone Paiute Tribe, we still support their station down on the Duck Valley uh, Reservation. And then the West Soil, West Kaja Soil Conservation District there in Burley. And they help us out with Cottrell. So one of the first nighttime stations in the state as a pilot. They're continuing that effort. And they're the ones that ask me if, like, hey, we're pretty close to the mid state. We're considering going year round. We would like to do that. And so to have a partner that's comes to the table with that type of attitude is extremely helpful. Uh, we also operate a number of stations through the state. Uh, a lot of these are non-benefit and seasonal positions. We have had issues similar to our cooperators with uh, recruitment and retention of seasonal staff. Uh, we're trying to think outside the box, like offering some employee housing, a, a benefit package if we can, some other incentives, maybe a sign-on bonus or an exiting bonus, something like that. So we're considering other, other, um, you know, other incentives to get them to come and stay. So we offer, um, we operate North Fork, Highway 87 and 20 by Allen Park, the Jackpot Station, Kuski, Du Bois, and a little station at Redfish. And that station actually, it's at Redfish, but we have other um, instructions in that area. Law enforcement support continues to be with the Idaho State Police, as well as the local county. There's a, an open invitation and an offer to enter in an agreement with all the counties that have an inspection station within their jurisdiction. Um, it's for any and everything that we can get up to a cap. And so if, if it's a county that's running pretty lean and they don't have the capacity to help out, it could simply be zero support. And at the end of the year, we would say, great, Thank you. We would appreciate a little bit more support next year, but it's really, that is the minimum. Um, the cap is really anything that they can provide to us. Um, we do uh, a reimbursement for the time, the labor side, as well as the mileage, and any other expenses that they think is needed for the inspection stations. We try to focus during high hours of traffic. Uh, nonetheless, they can always call dispatch when needed. Uh, we're getting really good communication with the dispatchers giving a description of the watercraft, uh, the time of the day, and then they'll, they'll bring them back. We continue to operate roving crews, and this came in very helpful for the mid-snake response and having equipment and staff that we can quickly pull into a specific area. Um, typically, these crews are accustomed to working on the weekends and working remotely, kind of on an on-call basis. And so when you call them up, and even if they're up in North Idaho, and say, hey, I need you down in Twin Falls next week, they're generally game for helping out. So typically the roving crews itself, again, it's an inspector, uh, watercraft inspection and education, high use areas, working over the weekends, 
um, and we, we try to staff five of them. And they'll do a little bit of uh, workload sharing with the survey crew. So we try not to have one crew just focus on watercraft inspection roving. Uh, they'll do plankton toes, they'll do adult surveys and kind of mix it up, jump on the survey boats. Again, a lot of this stuff is going to be in flux. Okay? There's going to be conversations this winter and as we're going into the next legislative session about where's the program going from here. Typically, we do this every year, right? But I think that coming from the mid-snake response, there's going to be an increase of awareness and attention to the program, which is great. Um, we're going to see some good changes coming out of that. Um, this, honestly, is a little shed that could. So one of the first years we bought little sheds, prior to that, we were renting buildings and working out of trucks and pop-up canopies. Sure enough, we got the approval to buy this little shed. Um, they're made in Jerome. It's an old hickory shed. Uh, Jerome's just right outside of Twin Falls. And we got a new shiny building for Cottrell. So this little shed went to Bear Lake to help out with the milfoil removal project. They moved to a trailer. This shed was just sitting there. And sure enough, I need a shed for Centennial Park. So I called the same company that I used before and had them put them on a trailer. So now we, for our containment and our mandatory inspection decon at Centennial Park, we got us a shed as of a couple of weeks ago. And just a reminder again, the water body is still closed in preparation for the opening, mandatory inspection decon for exiting watercraft. There's also needs to be a conversation of what does containment look like for watercraft inspection and protecting the uninfested Idaho and the uninfested any more questions for men? <laughs> Sorry, I took too much time. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hey, right. Tom? Okay. Tom Wolf, Montana Fish Wild Parks. So I've only got about 50 slides. <laughs> so, Settle in. Just a real brief update. Um, Hold on. Oh, great. Sorry. Hold on. Slow down. Give us a little break. Uh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> great <Yeah>. update. Um, <laughs> 130,000 inspections in Montana this last season. The weeds, 53 intercepted with mussels, exactly the same as last year, which is interesting. Uh, over 8,000 decontaminations, eight with illegal bait or fish. Uh, we're also inspecting. Continue with the quality assurance, quality control focus. That's something that uh, my team has really been instrumental in implementing, and we continue to push to make things better, making sure every inspection is consistent and accurate, so we're not missing things. And we miss things because we deal with humans out there. So trying to figure out better ways to, to do the job out there and make sure it's consistent. We'll be talking about QA, QC a little bit. Um, and then partnerships, uh, which is a big part of our program. In Montana, I am fortunate because I have a great team of people that support uh, watercraft inspection, early detection, outreach, and education. Um, they are the core of what is going on in Montana, working really closely with partners, too, because most of the programs put on the ground by partners. So we've got um, four inspection stations that are operated by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks staff. The rest are through contractors, um, which are conservation districts, tribes, um, through partnerships. Also with survey and early detection, we have a lot of partners out there collecting samples for us, sending samples to our lab, but also just eyes in the field looking for basic things. And all these folks are helping us with outreach and education, delivering that clean, drain, dry message in their local about three quarters of our inspections are conducted by partners now in the state, and that continues to grow. We're bringing on more and more as opportunities come up. Um, I want to highlight the fact that Army Corps of Engineers provides staff at Libby, up from the Libby Dam, for one of our inspection stations. So also, like looking for different angles to get more people to help us out out there in the field. And again, partnerships is, is what makes that's the magic out there, and that's why um, I feel we're doing a great job. Something that's new, just to bring to your awareness, um, we've gotten a lot of questions for Pex in Eastern Montana. It's an incredibly high-used water body. Um, it's got pike, it's got salmon, 
it's got lake trout. Um, it's a huge fishery that's just really booming right now. People from all over the Midwest come to Port Peck. One of the questions that came up is how many boats are getting missed that are arriving in Port Peck? Um, and we didn't know. So we worked with a local conservation district, put inspectors at boat ramps. They weren't necessarily inspecting boats. They were just approaching out-of-state boat, boats with out-of-state registrations, asking if they've been inspected. If they haven't, if they hadn't, they would do that and get that done because inspection before launch is Montana's law. You have to be inspected. So they would help them fulfill that requirement and then ask how old they got missed. Did you come in at night? What was the corridor? <coughs> you the pathway to get into the state? We interviewed 411 people, uh, voters last year, and only 10 had not been inspected. So that shows we're doing a pretty darn good job. Um, half of those were coming in in the dark because those stations aren't open in the eastern border. Half of those took really weird routes coming in backwards. Um, but uh, we're going to continue that project this next summer and expand it to Flathead Lake this next year, working with the local conservation district and the tribe um, to continue to figure out where gaps are. And, and also just have that extra presence if somebody gets missed, we've got somebody potentially there to catch them and get them inspected. Since 2017, this is where muscle fog boats are coming from and where they're going. Um, again, the Midwest is a significant source of these things. A lot of these, about half of these, are recently purchased boats. Buy a boat, it's got muscles on it, um, it's in the water, and two days later it's ready to launch your flat at with live muscles. Every year you're seeing that pathway persist. Um, so hopefully working with Pacific states to the next step of call before you all, we can continue to try to tighten that up a little bit. The stars on the map are new, right? We know where muscles are nationally. The stars are concerning because that's in the last couple of years are these new detections. Uh, it makes me very nervous because we've held that line for so long and these are new. Um, our landscape has changed. And I think our approach needs to change. Collectively, um, we need to be working closer together than ever, than ever because our landscape is here. And, you know, for the snake, um, we hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Um, and I think through this group, we are, we've been talking about this issue for a long time, and, and we are really well poised to work together to try to address this situation and plan. Moving forward, um, I know Oregon's plan and Washington's plan and Idaho's plan, and we should all be sitting down talking about this right now. We gave this out because we hope that's not the case, but we should plan for it. Those muscles moving downstream and trying to keep them in that corridor so that they're not moving someplace else. Because I'm fortunate, I'm upstream in Montana, um, but it's the same thing with those boats hopping from one place to another. Um, going to talk a little bit more about Pactola, that star in the Black Hills there. Uh, the state of South Dakota asked for help this this fall. So they were removing uh, docks from, or they're closing their marinas in Pactola. Um, all those boats were coming out and the state didn't have the capacity to inspect them. So I sent two, two crews down there for two weeks. Um, they intercepted 73 muscle file boats coming off of Pactola. The state didn't have the capacity to inspect them. And through this next season, um, they plan to operate inspection stations there 10 hours a day, closing, closing at 5 o'clock in the evening. Not, not good enough. Um, last year, we inspected in Montana about 40 boats that were coming off the pack total. Only 20% 20 20 of those have been inspected before we saw them. Again, not good enough. I'm um, working really closely with Bureau of Reclamation. We might have a pathway to help the state put a cork in that bottle. If nothing else, just make sure it's uh, daylight inspection. So all boats that are coming off when it's light out get inspected. That would be a huge step. Currently, we're still working on that. But when we're talking about Montana, the threats to Montana and Wyoming, Pactola is only 70 miles from Montana, about 20 miles from Wyoming. So it's danger close. And in the Black Hills, the boater, boater use in the Black Hills is for these boats to hop around depending on where the wind is blowing and where the fish are fighting. So if, if in fact they're just in Pactola, this is our one shot to try to keep it from not to put out the places. And this is from the Colorado database just showing boats from Pactola are going all over the place, Yellowstone, Glacier, um, 
It's a small little lake, but people travel to get that lake pretty, pretty often. Also, I want to visit, uh, so this is out of the view of a lot of people here because we're not in the Columbia Basin, but on the other side, when you look over the hill, uh, main stem Missouri system, that star uh, in South Dakota there uh, on the Missouri is Lake Oahe. Um, that's uh, just detected last week. It jumps a big dam in the Missouri River system. It's still about 100 miles from North Dakota, but that's the same system. And a boat with muscles could move up and down that system. We would expect them to move upstream fairly easy on watercraft right there. And then there's one more dam of Lake Sacagawea and then Fort Peck upstream of that. We're seeing those dominoes start to fall. They're moving closer. And really, when we talk about containment in those systems, they're huge. And there's lots of boat ramps. I'm concerned. And I'm really looking forward to the Army Corps study on motor movement moving back and forth from those systems because people that fish for walleye hit all these all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, Peck, SAC. So, uh, another portion of the program, we got, we got these people moving around, making sure they're aware of our putting grade drive message, to make sure they're they're aware of Montana's inspection before launch requirements. So if you're coming into Montana, you have to get your boat inspected before it hits the water. And a lot of these outreach tools are delivered in local communities by local partners, um, which is great. Signage, bringing that don't let it loose message out there for, for urban ponds and that type of thing, waiting anglers. Um, and again, delivered by local partners it is a huge huge part of what we do out there, as well as our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks national marketing campaign, targeting voters who are coming to Montana through social media, through uh, outreach and education, people that are searching online to come to Montana with a boat, trying to get them with that message. And then I want to hit up um, AmeriCorps volunteers. I've been fortunate, uh, last two years, I've had an AmeriCorps member um, who's led our charge on outreach and education. And I can't recommend it enough. If you have the pathway to work with AmeriCorps, um, these people are motivated, they're dedicated, uh, they bring new energy to a program where you're just old and burnt out and don't feel all that great. They come in and just have a new and different perspective on life. It really helps uh, a team that's getting tired and yeah, you get beat down by aquatic invasive species, as you all know. So I highly recommend uh, AmeriCorps folks is an asset. And I think I've shown this before, but she all, Sophia and I worked on social media and outreach, taking different approaches to get information out there to the public. Um, I would never come up with something like this. And I don't know how, how effective something like this is. Um, it gets the message out there and maybe gets somebody's attention that you wouldn't otherwise. Just thinking outside the box for different ways to get information out there. So for focus areas for next season, um, containment issues in Idaho and South Dakota. Um, they're get, muscles are getting closer. We have to work together to make sure they're not hopping out and going to different places. And collectively, we're all, that's our goal, all of us. Um, so how can we work together to make that happen? Um, we're going to expand our operational window in a number of Montana inspection stations, uh, operating longer seasons in response to these detections. Um, investigate additional stations in corridors that potentially could be moving boats through, um, bringing on more partners, more social media. Um, that pathway of boats coming in from the Great Lakes continues to be wide open, We're trying to figure out better ways to, to get to those used boat sales as they come into the state. That's all. No, it was 20. It was. Question for Tom? Do we feel like we have a good handle on other types of watercraft, so construction equipment, recreation clean water version, which is that traditional recreational vehicle for watercraft? Yes, yeah. so, <laughs> so inspection is required. Uh, we, I think most of us work with our tra transportation departments, so if there's floating barges moving through, we get notice. Um, but there's still gaps. 
especially the school employees. Why do they get so much like a sudden trap? Why are you not corrupted? Okay. Yes, very much. Thank you. Um, boats that, uh, like wakeboarding boats, they take on water. They have those plastic bags inside. How, how do you deal with that at the inspection stage? 120 degree water, we de de decontaminate them. So any ballast boat entering Montana, our law is it must be decontaminated if it's going to be launched. So you can, they have a system you can put water into that ballast boat. Okay. It can be complicated. Yeah, I'll send you a link. What's going on? Okay. Um. No, hold on. Just a second. <laughs> okay. So, what? It's it's ten thirty, right? Almost. Okay. So I know that you are not going to give a three minute update. We're three minutes away. From, <laughs> we're three minutes away from break. So I think we should just take a break. Yeah, break. Let's take a break. <laughs> so, we'll, take, we'll take a break, and I'll make, there was something going on with your PowerPoint, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I changed it in there. Okay. You said to save it. Yep, no, we're good. Okay. I'm going to just, yep, I'm going to I'm going to give know. a message to our remote phone, and I'll pull it up over there and see what's okay. going on. Um, um, Okay, where do we have the information? Yeah. And fifth? It makes sense because well initially there has to be Okay, so make sure it's working well, it was coming up with some yeah, it's weird it's I added pictures. I, I set it, I put it in the first okay, time, and then so I enabled the files. Files. Wait, this file is on a network location. Other users yeah. have access. Yeah, yeah that's so I was going to say yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. And but they're there. It's, it looks like they're there. <laughs> okay, yeah, here. I'm sure cool. he has a surprise at the end. Of the time. Well, don't, 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 don't show okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're here. You know That's me right. already. <laughs> All right. Um, don't give it away yet. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Am I having a big boy Maybe a little. <laughs> okay, where are we? I'm sharing. I'm already sharing, so I need to go like this. Do you guys need anything else? I'll walk around for a bit. Yeah. Right there? I think we're good. Sweet. Do I want more time off? Yes, that's the same time off. I just had to wait until to submit it. Until... This conference will now be recorded. Good, good morning. Thank you for everybody being here. And thank you for Leah and Stephen for icing the kicker, calling the time out right before I was going to put the put through the upright. <laughs> yeah, that's a great thing. Got me off my game. So anyway, I'm going to go over to the 20, 2023 Watercraft Inspection Program in the state of Washington. And our 2023 program did not look hardly any different from 2022. In Washington, we actually have a really small budget for doing this, uh, state funds. But thank God that we have, um, I have guardian angels through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and where's Heidi McMaster? my other guardian angel that takes care of me and gets me grants and also U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we operate essentially five check stations. We operate, I'm gonna make sure I can do the pointer. Oh, oh no, crap, I did again. Okay, which is the pointer, Leah? I think it's the little red okay, got unobtrusive thing, okay. yeah. So. For 2023, our, our permanent stations, and we got, we're going on the, on the thing of, if we make them permanent and keep them running, we don't have to have all the startup costs, we don't have to have all the training, we try to keep our inspectors going on and we get good quality out of it. And so our Spokane is running seven days a week, 365 days a year, we do not close it. And actually for a period of time in August and September, a little bit in July, we went to seven days a week, 24 hours a day, because we brought on some seasonal staff, we had some funds, and unfortunately we could not keep 
our seasonal staff for our graveyard shift. So we, we do run seven days a week and we run daylight to dark at Spokane. Our other permanent station down at Pasco, again, we have permanent crew there. It is 365 days a year. It is working. Those stations are operating right now as we speak. We have a pilot project. Um, which is our Southwest Washington Ridge Field. And that actually, we started out as a static station. Unfortunately, we weren't getting that much traffic because of where it was located. And we have not found the magic silver bullet location for a static station yet. We are still operating it, but we are operating it with roving stations. And it is operating right now as we speak. I've got folks out running two ramps to try to catch as many boats as they can at the major ramps down there. Uh, Clarkson, we just opened that up last year. This is also funded through a pilot project through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we were able to move it, and I'll talk, talk about that when we get to it, but that is operating seven days a week right now. We intend to keep it open through the winter, all, all into next year. And then our one seasonal station is Cleallum, and we're moving to it make permanent. It won't be a year-round because it gets closed down with snow. But we currently now operate that usually from March through October. So these are year to date numbers as of December 1st. So Spokane Station, we've done 21,742 inspections there. We've dealt with 19 zebra quagamots with watercraft. They've done 34 full decons, you see 199 plant decons. And the big one there that sticks out is the fact that we've got the inspected 2,500 that were last on zebra and quagga positive waters. Cleon, like I said, this is actually, we're excited on this one. This year we improved our infrastructure. We're trying to make this a permanent station. It'll be a permanent seasonal one. We got in a new um, unit office that our, our folks put together these. We've been moving these in. These are those storage containers, the, the transport ones, but we turn around and our crews take and they completely uh, frame them on the inside, insulate them, wire them. We put heating and air conditioning in them and we plug them in, they go and they get, and we get Wi-Fi as well. And so at uh, Cleellum for our March 31st through October 20th season this year, they did over 14,000 inspections, 14,888. They dealt with Three zebra quad muscle watercraft, and as you can see, the other one when we get down there, 4,200 um, were last on zebra quad muscle positive waters. Pasco, another one, this is again permanent now, and this is how we're doing. We're working our infrastructure as we build these things. We put put in the infrastructure and we move towards the permanent station as we operate. Also, that that indicator was uh, actually through a grant through BOR. Thank you, Heidi, again. Um, at Pasco, they did 7,100 inspections this year. They've got two zebra mussel boats, and almost 4,000 were last on zebra mussel positive waters. Clarkston, so this is the one that, oh, I'll get down, back to the one. Um, Clarkston, we opened it, like I said, last year. We had staffing problems down there trying to get people, even though we had we ran lots of um, recruitments, but it was just trouble getting them. We had two employees that we had got that we could count on. One of them had to go out for almost four months because of a medical issue. And so we were down to one person. We ran it four days a week, um, average this year. We moved our station. So this is another one of those things. Uh, our original station down in Clarkston was down at the port of Clarkston. I don't have the map on here, but it was a actual horrible location. Major boat ramp. But the problem with it was our station was about two blocks from the boat ramp. And anybody that was coming into the boat ramp actually had to drive past it, go down, do a loop. We've had signs asking them to do it and telling them to do it. But again, some did, some did. What we did this year is actually uh, we found a location. Thankfully, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers weren't using. It's actually out on Highway 12. And it is the old Chief Timothy Interpretive Center. That is our new building, and we actually reclaimed that. That is an after picture. I should show you the before picture. What happened was uh, Sergeant Taylor, uh, as I went down to check him one day, she goes, hey, I found a location that we want to think about that's a great spot on the highway. And I said, what was it? She goes, did you see that big patch of blackberries that you drove past? <laughs> yeah, it was a huge, yeah, it was a huge patch. There's a building under that. 
<laughs> no. And anyway, and so believe it or not, and I am not kidding, that building was completely covered with the exception of a little entrance, that entrance there, which was boarded up with plywood, I might add. Um, and it was completely covered with blackberry bushes. We were able to work with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to do their lease Vista recreation, and they gave us, they weren't using it, obviously, nobody was using it. Um, they gave us a cooperative use agreement. They're not charging us as long as we take care of it. And so we, our crews came in and we completely removed all the blackberry bushes we discovered. And we were moving it to that little spot there. That actually turned out to be a heat pump that we did not know was there. So we actually had heating and cooling there after we got it up and running. Um, but our, we moved it to there, and as soon as we started moving there, we got more inspections that we had going. We got re-upped for 2024. U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service gave us a grant to run it all next year. And so in preparation for that, we actually ran another recruitment, and we got two more employees to up it to four. And as of last week, our two existing employees decided to retire. So now we're back down to two. But since it's right now through the winter, um, these two are great employees, and we are alternating them, and we are running it seven days a week, unless one of them quits or gets another job. Uh, but they are a project, and they are slated to go all through 2024. And so they're right now, again, numbers are a little low because, again, of how we've had to do. We are supplementing. We were supplementing out of the Pasco office because we only had two folks. We were running some of our inspectors to go and do roving in the area and help out work so we could keep it open. But as you can see, this may go up next time. 462 of the watercraft that they inspected down there were last on Zebra Quad Muscle Waters. Like I said, Southwest Washington, we started originally at a static location. It was one of our port of entries with our state patrol. Um, unfortunately, trying to run the boaters through all of the commercial semis that we're going through on I-5 did not work out. And we've not found the, the magic location yet on I-5 or I-205 corridor. So to maximize our inspection priorities or opportunities, we run them roving. And we, have, we hit all the major boat ramps there. And as you can see, it accounted for 10,000 oh, 10, inspections. It's still going right now. We did not get any zebra quagga muscle boats down there, but we did have 5,600 last on positive waters. We did also supplement with some roving inspections through the year. Through the year, um, our Southwest crew we actually sent them up to Baker Lake, which is up in Snow County, because we have great big sockeye season up there, and we got a call from. <laughs> We got a call from we got a call from going, hey, we have all these these boats, a lot of them are out of state. Can you come up and provide it? So that was actually for five days. We did two weekends, I did six days. We did two or three weekends up there, sent through up there, they did 833. The rovings, like I said, out of Clarkston and Pasco, 662. We are working with Lake Roosevelt National Park. Um, and Lincoln County Sheriff's Office, we've got a few days up in that neck of the woods with helping them out on about 84. And then we have a cooperative agreement with the Diamond Lake Homeowners Association, and they actually have a volunteer inspector that we have trained that does inspections on our behalf for that particular lake. And that one equated to another 1,300 inspections. Out of, out of the roving inspections, almost 600 boats were last on zebra quad muscle positive waters. So we're still working on this, but as you can see, we've been going up every year, except we had a dip last year. But as of 2023, <clears throat> um, for our stations and roving, we have over 1,352 operational days, and we're edging up to 58,000 inspections right now. I'm expecting that we will be over 58,000 inspections as of December 31st. Just a little kind of anecdotal evidence. Our Spokane station right now is averaging between 40 and 50 inspections a week. So we're still having boats moving through. Pasco is averaging probably 20 a week. Um, the Southwest is down in Vancouver, they're averaging, their, their numbers are up because they're roving and finding the boats. So, um, other little bit of interesting tidbit, last year, because again, we ran 365 days last year with our Spokane station um, from January to March of this year, that's when we caught three or four muscle boats. 
So they are moving, they are moving in the wintertime. Uh, like I said, for, for 2024, right now, I do not foresee any change with how we're operating stations with the possibility of our Southwest Washington. That is right now dependent upon a grant. Um, I'm taking a gamble and I'm using some of my emergency funds to keep the crew on through March. It's pending whether or not we get funded through BOR. If we don't get the funding as of March, I will probably be shutting down that operation because we just don't have the same funds to do it. Um, we also are going to be waiting. We had a ask from a representative, uh, Mary Dye, who is down out of the Clarkson area of Sophie County. She's concerned about the Idaho situation. And Justin and I have put together a supplemental budget that she wants to try to push through this legislative session. If we get it, Southwest Wide, and we don't get the OR, Southwest Washington will stay open, but we will increase our footprint down in the Clarkston area. We're going to try to put, we're going to solicit for additional inspectors. Hopefully we can, if they're permanent ongoing funds, we can put them as permanent positions and we might get a bigger solicitation. So, but other than that, for 2024, we're going to be doing the same thing. So, and that's in a nutshell for this, but I have one last slide before we go to questions. And I need Stephen to stand up. No. Yes, you have to stand up, Stephen. Why? Because I need you. And I want you to stand up and give everybody the look that you're giving me right now. <laughs> I have looked for years and years to find Stephen Stoppelganger because of all the looks he's given me over the years. Not a human doppelganger. I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's Stephen Stoppelganger. That's a good one. Stoppelganger <laughs> wisdom. Yeah. I, I think of him as a wise old owl. A grumpy wise old owl. But okay. <laughs> Um, all right, I think our the last two speakers for this section, I believe, have been pulled, which were remote, have been pulled away for um, personal reasons. So I don't, unless you're out there, Kevin Nutcher or Josh Leonard, disguised as a phone caller. Okay. Uh, incidentally, I'm not seeing our next speaker. So just hang on a second. That's a really cute owl. <laughs> kind of owl is that? They love insects. That's their favorite food. All kinds of beetles. They're really cute and small. I came across that. I had got that look from Steven so many times. It's a holiday sweater. <laughs> Okay, so this next section, I'm just waiting for um, Sarah Rickliffs to join. So, that's right, right? Okay, so we're going to kind of segue into a discussion about um, watercraft inspection, quality assurance, quality control for QAQC, right? And Invasive Species Action Network has been involved in providing um, but, you know, whether it's QAQC, but mystery shopper services for um, many years for multiple states and, um, and Lake Tahoe. So Sarah Rickliffs with Invasive Species Action Network is going to join um, and give us a bit of an overview on that. I just, there she is. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Um, hi. Um, Thanks for joining. I know you're juggling multiple um, meetings today, so appreciate yeah. you 
pop it on here. Um, so Sarah's going to give a bit of just kind of an overview of how um, ISAN has been involved in QAQC, but then we're going to segue into just kind of talking about that as a group in general. Um, okay. Is that, is that good? Can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. So Sarah is the fresh um, executive director of Invasive Species Action Network. She's joining us from Montana. Um, yeah, take it away, Sarah. Okay, thanks, Leah. Um, like she mentioned, I'm the executive director at ISAN, and um, for years we've been doing watercraft inspection station quality assurance and quality control. Um, we've been, you know, kind of at a range of sizes, right? We do uh, QAQC at Lake Tahoe, so that's a small water body based survey effort. We've also done statewide efforts, um, really conforming those those survey methods to programmatic goals at a state level. And then we also do this multi-state level um, effort across the Columbia River Basin. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Really quickly before we move into the Columbia River Basin specifically, um, I'll talk a little bit about QAQC in general, right? What we can expect when we implement a QAQC program um, to really measure performance. We're really ultimately looking to improve a program. So that can be done at the operations level, but ultimately at the end product level. So in operations, we're looking to identify trends and that can be based on performance um, or kind of from a geographic standpoint. We'll correct any issues, provide feedback, and then we can improve efficiency and ultimately when we make those adjustments at the operations level, we're really looking to improve that end product where we can meet or exceed standards, right? We're looking maybe to meet industry standards or regional standards, or potentially just meeting those um, objectives that are, that are um, outlined for our state program. But we also wanna balance that by meeting or exceeding customer expectations, right? With these WID stations in particular, we're looking at balancing the prevention of moving invasive species, but also getting folks back out on the road so they can get to where they're going and let them recreate and have fun and use the resource as expected. So with this Columbia River process, um, I'll kind of walk through this step by step a bit. So before we ever hit the road, there's a lot of planning and preparations that go on. Um, we reach out to AIS state leads and ask about you know which stations are open what are their hours do they have a directionality um, and essentially confirming what's available on the map uh, through psmfc's website and then we'll we'll gain contact information we identify you know what that um, situation will be when our evaluator gets to the station. What are they going to say as their last water body? What is the, What are they going to say as their next water body? And we take feedback from um, each state lead at that point. And then um, once we've got all of that information, we start to plan out the route. And that can actually take quite a bit of time because we do have to factor in things like directionality and highway construction. And we're really hoping to maximize the number of stations that we can hit um, while minimizing the number of miles that we're driving and um, the number of days we spend on the road right so we want to really maximize the funds and leverage the resources that we have to be able to do it so once we hit the road uh, we obviously visit our wid station and we present ourselves as a low risk boater right those those previous water bodies and those next water bodies, we're really looking to show ourselves as a low risk voter with the one caveat of we leave our bilge plug in place. Uh, once we go through the inspection and the interview, we'll leave the WID station. And just as um, a quick note, when we go through the inspection and the interview, we are not pushing that staff member or staff members in any way so if they're not asking a question that we would maybe expect them to ask or something that's on our evaluation checklist we're not driving the conversation in any way to um, potentially push them to ask that question right we're just simply going through what they're asking of us 
So once we leave that WID station, our evaluator will pull off to a safe spot and um, record the evaluation in the checklist. And we'll walk through that checklist um, step by step here soon. And um, then they'll write a short narrative. They can do that right there, or maybe they'll do that later that night, but they always do it same day. And then next, they'll kind of hide away the evaluation checklist and um, any receipt that they may have. If a boat seal was placed on the trailer, they'll remove that. You know, we want to keep that secret shopper status super secret. So then we just rinse and repeat till we've gone through all the stations. Um, and then we go into the reporting. But um, before I talk about reporting, I'm going to talk about the evaluation checklist itself. So the checklist has 26 section or 26 questions, and those are um, split amongst four sections. The first section being the check station location overview. These are all really simple questions. Um, essentially, anything that they can derive from pulling up to the station and um, meeting the inspection staff member and or interview staff member that they they work with. Um, then section two moves into the interview, right? The, these, are, these are questions about um, how ready are the staff? Did they ask about last water's next water? Um, did they talk about why you're there for the inspection, why it's necessary? Um, did they use a professional introduction? And that question, we're not really looking for anything intensive, right? We don't need to hear a resume or anything. We just kind of need to hear, hello, my name is Sarah. I work with X agency and I'm here to inspect your boat. And then the we get into the inspection portion of the evaluation checklist. And this is really the meat of the checklist. And I'll kind of break this down based on um, boat pieces. So as you can expect, we do wonder if our inspectors are inspecting the whole and exterior of the boat and that whether they've asked us to pull the plug and lower the motor um, and whether they've asked for permission to enter the boat and inspect. The picture below is our boat. This is what we haul around just as a reference. Um, it's certainly not the simplest of boats, but it's also not a houseboat. She doesn't have an air conditioner. She doesn't have a hot tub. We don't have any other jet skis or anything on board. So we do have interior compartments though. So that's the next section of the evaluation. Um, this picture shows a good portion of the interior of our boat. We've got a number of compartments, including a live well. So these are the three questions that we ask regarding um, inspection of boat interior. And then these are just some additional ones, things we would expect. Did they look for standing water? If it was there, did the inspector drain or remove it? Um, did they apply a boat seal and did they apply or, or did they give you a receipt? And then finally, the last section is about outreach. Did the inspector or interviewer provide any notes on outreach? Did they provide any printed materials um, to our evaluator? And all of these questions are answered in a yes, no, not applicable basis. So once our evaluator makes it home to Montana, we compile all the documentation, which does take quite a bit. We are hitting quite a few stations. Um, and then we start to analyze those results. And then once we've analyzed the results and written the report, we provide a full report to PSMFC. And that report looks very similar to what you would probably expect, right? We've got a title page, a table, table of contents, an introduction that kind of talks about the overview of the QAQC method, and then we go into methods. Our results section is always bro broken down by state, and then we um, complete the report with kind of a conclusionary section that talks about discussion of the overall results at a multi-state level. And that's provided to PSMFC. And then the individual state results are provided um, through Stephen at PSMFC with um, me included. And all of those results are confidential, so we don't share those in any way. Um, but each individual state receives their results. 
So in 2023, just really quickly, we hit 24 highway stations. And the highway stations on this map, if you're not um, familiar, are the kind of sun-shaped um, stations. The stations that we hit are not highlighted in this map. This is just simply which inspection stations are present across the Columbia River Basin. And we hit those 24 highway stations in nine days and we traveled through six different states to do so. Our inspection time on average was about three and a half minutes um, amongst those highway stations. So um, that's what I have and I thank you. Um, and I'll take any questions you might have now. And my contact information is provided here. Any questions about the QAQC process that's done by ISAN? Um, I have one. Sure. Um, how many times was each inspection station uh, visited for this? Was it just once per station for this whole process or was it multiple times? Right. Just the one time. So it, it really provides um, a snapshot, and that was I, I should have mentioned that. When when we provide our reports um, to the state, really what it's it's doing is that's providing a snapshot of one moment in time with one, maybe two staff members. Um, and so they can take that and really uh, use those results to measure against what their their program's goals are. Thank you. You're welcome. Tom. Hey, Sarah. So Montana contracts directly with ISAN for QAQC stuff. What other states last season did you contract with? Last season, we contracted with you and with um, Lake Tahoe, so not a full state-wide program. Thank you. Yeah. Teresa. Is there any um, value or thought about adding like non-motorized watercraft, like kayaks, to kind of test some of the stations, or are you just keeping the one type of boat? I think in general, um, just based on risk, we've um, had discussions about including non-motorized boats, but at this time, I think with just the elevated risk with motorized boats, that's what the focus has been on. But we would be um, happy to entertain non-motorized boats. We could toss one on the back. You can do whatever. Yeah, yeah, Jonas. Um, I might have missed it in the very early part of the presentation, but what's the mechanism for you guys doing the inspections across the six states? Is that through Pacific states, or you guys? Okay. I'm getting nods, so I think I got my yeah. question. Yeah. Right. So um, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission is our funder. And the survey effort is um, for the Columbia River Basin specifically. So, yeah, those six states would have been um, California, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, and we did not include, there are eight stations in the state of Montana that are within the Columbia River Basin boundary. But because we do that statewide effort in Montana, and we've historically done two rounds across the state of Montana. We don't include them in the PSMFC survey. Because you have a direct contract with Montana. Okay, cool. Yeah, Correct. And, uh, thanks, Sarah. And a couple other things. This is funded by Corps of Engineers and Bonneville Power Administration. Um, and last year we did Nevada. Um, and we don't share results very often, but the Shoshone Paiute Duck Valley Station in 2022 was one of our top stations. Um, so it's always good to hear that. Um, so, and I see that they're trying to get additional funding and that's good because they, they do a good job down there. Any other questions for Sarah? Oh yeah, we have, go ahead, Sam. Uh, Sarah, what information do you have about uh, inspector motivation when you go to these check stations? And secondly, is there any uh, older uh, comment form at the station that are provided? Did you catch that all, Sarah? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's okay, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks for your work. Um, 
what, what perspective do you have on employee motivation? Because that usually reflects in QAQC. And secondly, are, uh, are voters provided with any customer comment forms? Um, I can't really answer the customer comment forms. Um, it wasn't noted in any of the narratives if there were any customer comment forms. So that's kind of the, you know, the extent of what I know. Um, as for employee motivation, we didn't, you know, see anything explicit in the narr in the narratives about, you know, I don't think our evaluator ran across anyone who was openly complaining about their job or, or <laughs> you know, like jumping for joy as they approached the truck, right? Um, <laughs> I guess I would just say, you know, n no comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Sam, these are hard positions to fill. And so in our state whiskey meetings, we talk, we talk about this every year. And then on our calls, trying to retain, finding motivated individuals that can communicate. And the, for me, as I look, and then just to back up a little bit, if something's wrong and they go out, they're doing their report, but if the station's not open, we'll know right away if we want the state open. And that's a rare event. Uh, but getting especially younger people to, in, in the training to be a, in your training, um, to get them to practice, 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 going up to a voter and saying, my name is, I'm with, this is why we're doing this today. Um, this is what invasive species are. And it, it happens most of the time. But if you're doing 100 inspections a day, um, you may miss a few things, but the states are aware of that. And I think, um, and then the, the other part is funding this. Um, I think I saw Oregon's now up to sixteen twenty five an hour minimum wage in Washington too. Um, the state has been trying to catch up on paper. And, you know, you know this, we were talking about recruitment yesterday. It's tough. And when you find a gem, you hang on to them. So, I, Sarah, I don't want to, if you need to hop off, I know you're juggling another call, but like we're happy to have you stay on. But are we, is there any more questions for Sarah? But we're going to continue to discuss this. I just want to, like, if Sarah, you can stay, but if it, you need to jump off, that's totally appropriate. If we have no more questions for Sarah. I, I have a kind of oh, question yeah, slash yeah. comment. Because, again, it kind of goes along the lines of how your staff react. And so one of the things I know that, come, that comes up on this one is the bilge plug. So Washington does not have a law that says the bilge plug has to be removed. And so one of the things maybe going forward that might be is present the boat as a higher risk boat. Because my, my inspectors, if it, if it presents as very low risk, the boat's clean, the person has all the right answers, they don't, they don't have a blow to the motor. Because it's again, it's deemed a it's deemed a low risk, and one of the things we're trying to do because we're highway stations, is we are trying to get the person back on the road as much as possible. So having them get out of the rig, get in the get in the boat, lower the engine, pull the bilge plug, we don't do that unless it, it presents itself as a higher risk boat. So that's that's one of the things our our inspector can do. So it's just a thought on that, um, and that that goes along like on Sam's question. A lot of times on these. We wouldn't put a, a voter comment form for them to get out because again they're in and out most of the time unless it's a high risk boat in like two minutes and they are already really don't want to stop for that long so for putting a comment we I, you might get one out of every ten thousand birds and that would get out of their rig and fill out a comment form just uh, lots of things on that. so sam a possible social study would be surveying northwest voters get voter lists Send out a survey of people in the inspection station. Yeah. I mean, that's a fun little project. Yeah. Can you come first? Yeah. So she can hear you? Yeah. Sarah, can I make one quick, really quick. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Yep, go ahead. Just a quick okay. comment. So, thanks, for your, thanks for your help on the QAQC. I know you've been through Idaho and we've gotten a great report back and some things obviously to work on, but my experience with QAQC is they get really familiar with our state pickups and our state survey boats. And so it's hard to really get a good gauge on QAQC 
And so we reach out to state agencies and try to get eyes on them out there other than us. And so to have an extra layer like yourself and your crew to do that and get that feedback, I know it's just a snapshot in time, but just real quick, sure do appreciate your work. I know it's, you know, a week away from home, actually more than that, it's tough. And that's a long loop and it sucks, you know, so I appreciate your help. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to the Washington comment just real quick. Um, posing as a higher risk voter, I think that to a point we could probably adjust, you know, maybe when we contact um, Washington or whoever about um, what we're going to make that scenario when we visit those stations would be, we could adjust that to a point, but I also want to, um, just say we don't we don't want to push a decontamination just based on time alone. <laughs> um, you know we we don't want if we if we got a decontamination at even half of those stations that we visit that could add one to two days um, and that kind of exponentially increases costs and stuff. So um, I do think that there's some communication that could happen there to um, really balance that out for next year's efforts. Um, but, yeah. Well, I, and I'll, I'm not saying that it needs to be a decontaminated boat, but if it comes in and they would last on, say, Lake Mead, all of a sudden, if the boat presents itself that, then our inspectors will pull, you know, they should be pulling the plug on that and they should be then climbing in the boat. Again, if, there, if, if it presents as a low-risk boat, hasn't been on water, the outside is clean, they're not jumping in and doing, doing an internal inspection of every closed compartment. That, so again, it, there's certain things that trigger because again, it's, it's, if it comes a that person, they don't need to get in and, and open up every compartment because it's very low risk. The boat's clean, the boat seems knowledgeable. We're, we're, doing the, we're doing the inspection on the outside. We're, we're hitting the main spots. We're not climbing in and going through every compartment either on that. So that's just. But Eric, are you saying that if the evaluator says they just came from Lake Mead, they're not going to get decontaminated? No. Why would they get decontaminated if they're clean and dry? They're, so they're just from. Yeah, okay. you know, you, you would not. You would not just because they've been last on positive waters. If the boat is clean and dry, there is absolutely no reason to decontaminate. You can't. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we, as you saw, and. and my presentation, we had lots of boats that had last been on water. We didn't decon everyone. Even the ballast clean. tanks? Huh? What about the ballast well, tanks? That's a different story. Yeah. Different okay. story. So that particular boat yeah. and that scenario would not trigger a decon. I'm just trying to, for nope. Sarah's edification for next year, I think yeah. that we could, you know, that's good information. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's nodding here. <laughs> but you can't see everybody. Sorry. Um, oh. oh, what? You're on mute. Your music or still I, I said all I could see was like myself nodding. I can see you and me, Leah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I came up here, so you can feel like you're talking. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess some other questions we wanted to pose and maybe continue to discuss as it relates to QAQC programmatically. I mean. What ISAN does is one example of that, and I, you know, I think we're aware that, you know whether it's a tribal program, state program, you have the capacity to do other, you know, QAQC on your staff, right? Whether it's on the job training or, you know, secretly, you know, having other people go through stations, whatever. So I guess we're, we wanted to sort of query, like, what else is going on? Like, is that a priority? Do you spend time on that? Yeah, BC, what are you guys doing? I think one thing we've kind of been chatting about is um, that, Kind of in season training. So, post like yeah. post your training, you know, you provide it, they are given a full slew of information. And in particular, for some of our quieter stations, it could be there could be a you know a lag time from when they've been trained to when they actually have to do their first decontamination. And so, having that you know mechanism to do on the job training once they've left their the initial training because. It, if you got a complex boat and you've only had one opportunity to be trained and then like a month later you're seeing it again for the first time like it's and that may not be a like 
complacency. It's just a comfort, right? In terms of like, and so I think that's certainly one thing that we've been kind of trying to think about more and more is how do we integrate that into to just yeah. Don't have the solution. Yeah, to say any <laughs> solutions for because that's probably not just unique to the BC no. program, right? But you get folks out there. Yeah. Well, and that's that's like for for all the numbers in the state of Washington, I have thirteen permanent employees. So. And so, like at, at our our Spokane station, we only bring on uh, a couple of seasonals in, in the summertime to assist with the inspections. But I have my permanent folks, to, and, and we've established a hierarchy. And they do the decons if it comes to it. So there, we have our folks that know what they're doing, how they do it, and I'll put them up against anybody. It's if, if we're gonna if we're gonna decon a boat, they're gonna do it right. And, and so that's how we that's why we're moving towards the permanent staff because you have inspectors that know what they're doing, and they get to the point again. It's kind of like, okay, this boat, I need to something's causing the hair on the back of my neck to stand up. I'm gonna dig into this one more. Or, nope, this one. This one we can get down the road quick. So more that you can keep staff on that are familiar with it and knowing what they do when it comes to to the uh, decons, big time. And we have like our, our main person, he stays up on any new things that are coming out of the industry for like ballast boats. And it's amazing the things that he tells me about, oh, this is coming down the corner. We gotta start considering this when we're when we're doing decon. So if you can keep permanent people on that are specialized in that, that that'll help you with that. Yeah, we do try to pair up like when we're filling positions at station having a mixture of returning or senior inspectors with new inspectors, but as we all know, when there's challenges with filling locations, that may not be possible because we may have a station that has all new inspectors. And those are often some of our more remote locations where you know it's an eight hour drive. To our closest other stations, you can't easily just send someone up there every time you have to do decon, right? And so like, how do you kind of build in like a regular um, opportunity for that training? So, and I have a question too, is I see, which I think has been hugely helpful for state programs, um, maybe even provincial ones too, where you guys are relying at more of like that county level to help or higher. I know that's not. You guys are still training now. Let's say, like, I'm in, say Montana, right? You have a lot of conservation districts now that are providing the staffing. Like, I guess the QA is the QA and QC any different? You, they're still, you're still wanting to QA and QC those people, even if they're county employees, right? Yeah. So, so the state provides the training, um, but we also train supervisors for conservation districts and tribes as the local oversight. So they help with quality control. We emphasize that we've got workbooks, we have refresher trainings, we have a ballast uh, decontamination trailer that Reclamation purchased for us, which is a great tool to bring on site and retrain folks on decontamination and you can look inside and see how all the parts fit together just for that comfort thing because it's not that they don't know, it's just it's intimidating and, and trying to break that down and not stopping like all season long. Quality control, I think, is one of our biggest challenges collectively. And it's just, it's easier when you have full-time staff, but part-time staff you bring in every year, it, it's really, really hard. It takes a lot of work. And I think collectively thinking outside the box and pushing to add more things out there because it's never good enough. We all, always can be better. So you mentioned your work Uh, so uh, a workbook that my staff put together to help with staff at training. Um, so it's just a tool. Um, as the training proceeds, they uh, write things down in here. And, and we had a consultant come in to talk about how people learn. And it's part of that seeing and then doing, writing, um, tools like that. And then we have already have our, our manuals, all these tools that are provided at stations. Um, and then my staff are updating it all right now for this next season to keep it fresh, to keep it updated. Um, and it, it's something that inspectors have on staff. They're supposed to have it with them on shift all the time and during their downtime, look at it, which 
doesn't happen all that often. <laughs> so they have no excuse. But it's there right? for them. <laughs> right, right. And, and when our refresher trainings come around, so monthly we revisit each station, have a refresher training, and they're supposed to have their manuals to reference the things that we're checking and revising. And usually it's um, check and anchor compartments, ballast systems, um, those things that data entry. So we see issues in our data flow. Um, always checking, pushing them to do what they are supposed to do every time. So is that, is that standard? Do you guys do a monthly check-in in Washington? Do you do a monthly check-in with your, or is it more frequent? And Oregon too, sorry. Yeah, well, we do so far. I mean, each station has a manual that goes in detail of a decon. I mean, it's, you, you, can anybody read this and you can do an inspection or a temperature inspection? You're not efficient at it. But the question is, you, you give it to them a training, and they might look at it again during the season. So like July and August, especially the end of July and August, we get apathy start setting in. Because then you send, get an email, get the check and anchor. I mean, you got to remind the cost. Uh, if you can visit monthly, that would be great. I wish I had that luxury. Uh, so that's not always possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with the uh, same with the QA, QC, yeah. or states like, can you put special things in it? Like, you know, all of ours have state employees, that's by law, so we can't hire out. But things that I'm concerned about, are they wearing the proper safety equipment? If we find that, you know, it's hot, so they take off their safety vests. So could that be kind of part of the dressed to work? And I don't remember the form off the top of my head, yeah, but I yeah. think in the past there has been, and Sarah, I don't know if you're still on there. Um, yeah, I'm here. Think, one, I don't know, Sarah, if you, I feel like we had talked about too that, um, you know, how much of should the CRV snapshot in time be apples to apples? Because I think, you know, we recognize there was one variable with the Washington program, like, they're not allowed to do this, so you can't ask them to do this on the thing. So I think, you know, there's some small adjustments, but like how close should those evaluations be? Like, I guess that's like the ultimate question back to you, Stephen, as the requester of the work, you know, if, how comparable do you want the evaluations to be? Because really, I'm, now I'm speaking out of turn, ICAN can do anything, but, um, <laughs> but ICAN can do whatever is requested on an evaluation, right? right? That they just have to keep track, like, oh, we're in Oregon now. It's this show. Well, I'll be back. I, and I'm not, again, if our folks didn't load, load the motor. What I look at it is, is I always say, okay, what are the things out of this that I'm concerned about because they're applicable to your state? So I know that there's going to be certain things like forever today, I, I are gone mandatory. Don't ask permission. I mean, because right. we, we just don't, we don't want to go down that road. It's like, hey, we're here to inspect your boat, not people. But, but the things, again, it's like removing the plugs. Yeah, I know they didn't do it, they didn't present it, they didn't throw a red flag in me, but because of that, because I know that's not how we, how we do how our own trades. Right. But I was actually glad to see that actually down in Pasco, our one inspector, because it was a slow day, did have a little bit So, actually, probably was a newer person. <laughs> <laughs> so evaluation is good, because I look at them, and they come in, and that, most of the time, I don't look, look at the date first. I just read the comments, and I can tell, oh, that was so and so that day. And that's maybe for management purposes, maybe something we've talked to the person uh, over. So it's nice because when they know we're coming, everything's and somebody that's they don't know. It's, it's nice to get that report. What does it look like? And I've used like some of the grass clubs when they do the tournaments when they come through. They'll give me a call if they were they, they really nice or so what's the problem with the station. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that evaluation is helpful in that sense. On, on that note, what, what's, is your state illegal to have the bills plug in? Our state, yes and no. <laughs> yeah, they need to be drained. But well, if you know, they happen when water is of the state, uh -huh. then the plug has to be removed. If yeah. they're coming into our state, there's no law. But the plug has to be oh, okay. So only one station that really affects because okay. there's a lake in Oregon that they come from. Okay. 
power of good shit. No pull the plug. Don't pull the plug. I don't I do it. Free America. Yeah. Free America. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so with the VC program, we, we utilize uh, three sergeants uh, that are full, fully uh, appointed uh, conservation officers. And, and so they, they're responsible for the stations and, and to supervise the staff. So when they show up, obviously the staff are at attention kind of thing. But, um, so we really would like to utilize a secret motor uh, to, to make, it, make their way around the province. And then we're also, as Martina mentioned, um, uh, going to implement a training manual for on-the-job things. They can come to checklists and then and then actually do that um, uh, refresher decontamination. So we'll, we'll travel around with a with a uh, not a real complex boat, but one that's complex enough that they have to think about it, right? So. And we have an existing training manual, but of course it's similarly being reviewed at training and then. I think every truck is supposed to have one, but a lot did not get. And I would say it's not sort of as interactive as like a workbook. And so yeah, having that workbook to make it more interactive because, you know, the manual outlines everything, but, you know, how often they can be reviewed with something more in depth. And we did actually do, it was in maybe 2017 or 2018, we actually did a secret order exercise that started in Manitoba and went all the way to BC. It was the same person that traveled all the way through with the same snare and everything, and we had it run through probably, I mean, three or four stations in BC, and um, it was it was a really valuable exercise. And again, we want to start kind of, I think, trying to build that in yearly. So yeah, we certainly learned a lot from that exercise we did a few years back. So, okay. Teresa, are there um, online training tools for uh, our waterfront inspectors, or even like? Refresher uh, like quizzes or even like a Duolingo like app, you know, that they feel like. Do we have those resources Well, I, so there are short videos on the PSMFC, the western.org. Yes, right. And then Elizabeth is going to be talking, Elizabeth Brown is going to talk about training in general, so, so maybe she can expand a little bit on this. But there's short videos that I know multiple. Of the training folks are using, and I think you guys direct your staff to them. So there are videos available and other things, but those are great. I was thinking of bonus, like an electronic thing. If someone would go through a thing mid season, oh, you get like, yeah, yeah, like a an prize, like to incentivize it a little bit. Yeah. Like, oh, so and so is, or even make it a little competitive, like, oh, we have this, you know, internal, the, the state focus, so that you, you have the, the state laws or you're you're aware of the more specific laws. But that the other you know, oh if you if you got hundred percent on this you know mid mid year, right get a little incentive at the end. Yeah. I think that sounds cool. <laughs> I don't know how doable that is for you guys. But yeah. Um I don't are there besides those videos, are there other online things that you guys that's kind of it? Yeah. That depends if you have like Wi Fi at your store. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's <laughs> also another, a factor. Another difficulty. Um, all right, Stephen, any other thoughts you want to impart to the group on consistency <clears throat> across the basin in any way? I think um, for next year, we'll make sure that if we need to tweak our forms for each state, okay. do that. That's something we need to look at. Okay. Uh, maybe we're planning on doing it next year. Any other comments or queries about this concept? Well, I'll do one thing. So I pulled up my, because I went with my statewide coordinator after this. We had an exchange about it, and one of his things he didn't put on there. I think that had the secret shopper indicated a positive water body last week, it was way more blocky to get checked. Because that's, again, that's how we, it, it triggers things. So that's where, again, maybe mixing it up a little bit and again at a higher risk. Yeah, that's just for us. It would trigger, uh, I know it triggers our folks to, to then do more. Right. That's not, I'm not making an excuse, so, I'm just saying that's how it dealt with us. Sometime in the past, it's a while ago, I think somebody glued a zebra mussel on. <coughs> oh, no, I didn't. That didn't. And that didn't go well. No. <laughs> no. Um, that's, 
issue is if they're going to hit all the stations and they're high risk is that they, somebody says you got to be decontaminated but they still have to hit two more yeah so maybe we just need i know it's already a really long drive yeah. to do well, this it's a really long drive and then the other interesting there's a lot that um not data wise that sarah didn't reveal but there's a lot to being on the road um the whole idea of quote ghosting like if this boat gets entered into a database, it is not hidden. And then that person shows up 100 miles later and says, I've never been inspected before. So like, there's a lot of dynamic to that that needs to be like kept hidden. It's really hard. So um, so if you're triggering you know, the higher, yeah, it's a very complicated process. And it's way more than just driving around, as you can just kind of tell. Like, like the scenarios are really important. So yeah. Okay, well, I don't think we need to beat this topic up anymore. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing the, the great overview. And I know we're a bit breaking a bit early for lunch, but I think that's okay. Right, a little early. And they'll be delivered as well. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, so thanks everybody that presented this morning. Appreciate the information shared. Thank you, and we will come back. I believe it's a one. One fifty eight. Let's just see that. Maybe a little bit too long.